Welcome to the 90th birthday celebration of Richard Wilbur, Amherst College class of 1942, Poet Laureate of the United States, twice Pulitzer Prize winner, veteran of major World War II campaigns in Italy and France, and a Simpson lecturer, teacher, a very active teacher of the reading and writing of poetry at Amherst College. I am David Sofield of the English Department, one of Dick Wilbur's co-teachers. The organizers of today's celebration thought that we might best pay tribute to Dick by asking students and faculty here at the college to read some of his poems back to him. The 14 readers listed on the programs in your hands will proceed chronologically through the 68 and counting year career of Richard Wilbur as a publishing poet. You will note that half of the poems to be read today are Dick's translations thus honoring what has been a continuing achievement in the Englishing of work written in French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, Russian, and other languages. I will start with three poems from Dick's earliest books, poems that begin to indicate the variety of subjects and modes that mark the poet's range. The first, titled First Snow in Alsace, testifies to Staff Sergeant Wilbur's military service. It is a serious poem in a serious form. Dante's Terza Rima, on a clearly serious subject. The second, Winter Spring, begins a long and continuing run of poems in which the natural world is evoked with a precision, intelligence, and wit, to say nothing of formal mastery, equal to that of another Amherst College Simpson lecturer, Robert Frost. The third, Still Citizen Sparrow, opens a rich vein of poems intended, the phrase is the poet's own, for children and others. On to the pleasure then of reading Richard Wilbur. I would say also that there is a reception immediately after the reading, just behind me here in the lobby of Converse. First snow in Alsace. The snow came down last night like moths burned on the moon. It fell till dawn, covered the town with simple cloths. Absolute snow lies rumpled on what shell bursts scattered and deranged, entangled railings, creviced lawn. As if it did not know they'd changed, snow smoothly clasps the roofs of homes fear gutted, trustless, and estranged. The ration stacks are milky domes. Across the ammunition pile, the snow has climbed in sparkling combs. You think. Beyond the town a mile or two, the snowfall fills the eyes of soldiers dead a little while. Persons and persons in disguise, walking the new air white and fine, trade glances quick with shared surprise. At children's windows heaped benign, as always winter shines the most, and frost makes marvelous designs. The night guard coming from his post, ten first snows back in thought, walks slow and warms him with a boyish toast. He was the first to see the snow. Winter spring, which today isn't quite, but not far from it, another five degrees and we'd have it. A script of trees before the hill spells cold with laden seraphs. All the walls are battlemented still, but winter spring is winnowing the air of chill and crawls wet sparkling on the gutters. Everywhere walls wince and there's the steel of waters. Now all this proud Guayome is venised. Through the drift's mined dome one sees the rowdy rusted grass and we're amazed as windows stricken bright. This too soon spring will pass, perhaps tonight, and doubtless it is dangerous to love this somersault of seasons. But I am weary of the winter way of loving things for reasons. That's a Robert Frostian ending. And finally, Still Citizen Sparrow. This is from the second book, The Beautiful Changes. Still, Citizen Sparrow, this vulture which you call unnatural, let him but lumber again to air over the rotten office. Let him bear the carrion ballast up and at the tall tip of the sky lie cruising. 
Then you'll see that no more beautiful bird is in heaven's height, no wider, more placid wings, no watchfuller flight. He shoulders nature there, the frightfully free, the naked-headed one. Pardon him, you who dart in the orchard aisles, for it is he devours death, mocks mutability, has heart to make an end, keeps nature new. Thinking of Noah, child heart, try to forget how for so many bedlam hours his saw soured the song of birds with its wheezy gnaw, and the slam of his hammer all the day beset the people's ears. Forget that he could bear to see the towns like coral under the keel and the fields so dismal deep. Try rather to feel how high and weary it was on the waters where he rocked his only world and everyone's. Forgive the hero, you who would have died gladly with all you knew. He rode that tide to Ararat. All men are Noah's sons. Uh, I'm privileged enough to read from Things of This World. <clears throat> the first poem is Love Calls Us to the Things of This World. The eyes open to a cry of pulleys and spirited from sleep, the astounded soul hangs for a moment bodiless and simple as false dawn. Outside the open window, the morning air is all awash with angels. Some are in bedsheets, some are in blouses, some are in smocks, but truly there they are. Now they are rising together in calm swells of halcyon feeling, filling whatever they wear, with the deep joy of their impersonal breathing. Now they are flying in place, conveying the terrible speed of their omnipresence, moving and staying like white water. And now, of a sudden, they swoon down into so rapt a quiet that nobody seems to be there. The soul shrinks from all that it is about to remember from the punctual rape of every blessed day, and cries, oh, let there be nothing on earth but laundry, nothing but rosy hands in the rising steam and clear dances done in the sight of heaven. Yet, as the sun acknowledges with a warm look the world's hunks and colors, the soul descends once more in bitter love to accept the waking body, saying now, in a changed voice, as the man yawns and rises. Bring them down from their ruddy gallows. Let there be clean linen for the backs of thieves. Let lovers go fresh and sweet to be undone. And the heaviest nuns walk in pure floating of dark habits, keeping their difficult balance. Next is a black November turkey to AM and AM. Nine white chickens come with haunchy walk and heads jabbing among the chips, the chaff, the stones, and the corn husk shreds. And bit by bit infringe a pond of dusty light, spectral in shadow until they bobbingly one by one ignite. Neither pale nor bright, the turkey cock parades through radiant squalors, darkly auspicious as the ace of spades. Himself his own cortege, and puffed with the pomp of death, rehearsing over and over with strangled rawl his latest breath. The vast black body floats above the crossing knees as a cloud over thrashed branches, a calm ship over choppy seas, shuddering its fan and feathers in fine, soft clashes with the cold sound that the wind makes fondling paper ashes. The pale blue bony head set on its shepherd's crook like a saint's death mask turns a vague, superb, and timeless look 
upon these clucking hens, and the cocks that one by one, dawn after mortal dawn, with vulgar joy, acclaim the sun. Uh, I'll be reading the uh, French original of Charles Baudelaire, L'Invitation au Voyage, first, and then Richard Wilbur's uh, translation. Baudelaire, L'Invitation au Voyage. Can you hear? All right. Mon enfant, ma sœur, songe à la douceur d'aller là-bas vivre ensemble. Aimer à loisir, aimer et mourir au pays qui te ressemble. Des soleils mouillés, de ces ciels brouillés, pour mon esprit ont les charmes si mystérieux de tes traîtres yeux brillant à travers leurs larmes. Là, tout n'est qu'ordre et beauté, luxe, calme et volupté. Des meubles luisants, polis par les ans, décoreraient notre chambre. Les plus rares fleurs mêlant leurs odeurs aux vagues senteurs de l'ambre, les riches plafonds, les miroirs profonds, la splendeur orientale, tout y parlerait à l'âme en secret sa douce langue natale. Là, tout n'est qu'ordre et beauté, luxe, calme et volupté. Vois sur ces canaux dormir ces vaisseaux dont l'humeur est vagabonde. C'est pour assouvir ton moindre désir qu'ils viennent du bout du monde. Les soleils couchants revêtent les champs, les canaux, la ville entière, d'hyacinthe et d'or. Le monde s'endort dans une chaude lumière. Là, tout n'est qu'ordre et beauté, luxe, calme et volupté. My child, my sister, dream how sweet all things would seem were we in that kind land to live together. And there, love, slow and long, there, love and I, among those scenes that image you, that sumptuous weather. Drowned suns that glimmer there through cloud-disheveled air move me with such a mystery as appears within those other skies of your treacherous eyes when I behold them shining through their tears. There, there is nothing else but grace and measure. Richness, quietness, and pleasure. Furniture that wears the luster of the years softly would glow within our glowing chamber. Flowers of rarest bloom proffering their perfume mixed with the vague fragrances of amber. Gold ceilings would there be, mirrors deep as the sea, the walls all in an eastern splendor hung. Nothing but should address the soul's loneliness, speaking her sweet and secret native tongue. There, there is nothing else but grace and measure, richness, quietness, and pleasure. See, sheltered from the swells there in the steel canals, those drowsy ships that dream of sailing forth. It is to satisfy your least desire they ply hither through all the waters of the earth. The sun at close of day closed the fields of hay, then the canals, at last the town entire in hyacinth and gold. Slowly the land is rolled sleepward under a sea of gentle fire. There, there is nothing else but grace and measure, richness, quietness. Uh, I was recently rereading a famous letter to the Amherst student, uh, which is probably the only famous letter to the Amherst student. <laughs> uh, it was from Robert Frost, and he was writing to thank the students of Amherst College for the recent congratulations on the occasion of his 60th birthday. The year was 1935. His letter begins, it is very, very kind of the student to be showing sympathy with me for my age. But 60 is only a pretty good age. It is not advanced enough. The great thing is to be advanced. Now, 90 would be really well along and something to be given credit for. <laughs> and so we are all here today, uh, as I would like to thank Ed Frost's suggestion, to give credit where it is richly due. Uh, I am going to read uh, 
two poems for today's occasion, both from Advice to a Prophet, one a poem of summer and the other belonging to autumn. Uh, the first is called uh, Two Voices in a Meadow. And as you might guess, it's in two parts, a milkweed. Anonymous as cherubs over the crib of God, white seeds are floating out of my burst pod. What power had I before I learned to yield? Shatter me, great wind, I shall possess the field. A stone. As casual as cow dung under the crib of God, I lie where chance would have me, up to my ears in sod. Why should I move? To move befits a light desire. The sill of heaven would founder, did such as I aspire. And the other poem is in the program. It's called October Maples, Portland. Uh, this is not one of the famous Portlands, but Portland, Connecticut. The leaves, the little time they have to live, were never so unfallen as today, and seemed to yield us through a rustled sieve the very light from which time fell away. A showered fire we thought forever lost redeems the air, where friends in passing meet, they parley in the tongues of Pentecost. Gold ranks of temples flank the dazzled street. It is a light of maples and will go, but not before it washes eye and brain with such a tincture, such a sanguine glow as cannot fail to leave a lasting stain. So Mary's laundered mantle in the tale, which like all pretty tales may still be true, spread on the rosemary bush, so drenched the pale slight blooms in its irradiated hue, they could not choose but to return in blue. Um, hi, I am going to read Professor Wilbur's translation of a poem by Jorge Guillén called Muerte a lo lejos. So I'm going to read the original first in Spanish and then the translation. Muerte a lo lejos. Je soutenais l'éclat de la mort toute pure, Valérie. Alguna vez me angustia una certeza, y ante mí se estremece mi futuro. Acechándolo está de pronto un muro de la rabal final en que tropieza la luz del campo. Mas habrá tristeza si la desnuda el sol? No. No hay apuro todavía. Lo urgente es el maduro fruto. La mano ya lo descorteza. Y un día entre los días, el más triste será. Tenderse deberá la mano sin afán. Y acatando el inminente poder, diré sin lágrimas, embiste, justa fatalidad. El muro cano va a imponerme su ley, no su accidente. Another translation called Death from a Distance. When that death certainty appalls my thought, my future trembles on the road ahead. There, where the light of country fields is caught, in the blind final precinct of the dead, a wall takes aim. But what is sad is to bear by the sun's gaze. It does not matter now, not yet. What matters is the ripened pear that even now my hand strips from the bough. The time will come, my hand will reach someday without desire. That saddest day of all, I shall not weep, but with a proper awe. For the great force impending, I shall say, Lay on just destiny. Let the white wall impose on me its own capricious law. Happy birthday. I'm going to read one poem by Anna Akhmatova, first in Russian and then in Mr. Wilbur's translation. Um, Akhmatova herself did a lot of translating, and someone described her translation work in a way that, to me, applies to Richard Wilbur's. One humbly admires the technical modesty and tact and the spiritual perfection. The poem is called Lot's Wife, and I think you know the story. Lotova Zuna. I pravidnik shol za paslenikom Boga, agromne i svetle, pačorne garjej. Но громко жене говорила тревога, не поздно, ты можешь еще посмотреть на красные башни родного Содома, на площадь, где, где пела, на двор, где прила, на окна пустые высокого дома, где милому мужу детей редила. Взглянула, 
и скованы смертной болью, глаза ее больше смотреть не могли. И сделала с тела прозрачную солью, и быстрые ноги к земле переросли. Кто женщину эту оплакивать будет? Не меньше ли мениться она из утрат? Лишь сердце мое никогда не забудет отдавшую жизнь за единственный взгляд. Lot's wife. The just man followed then his angel guide, where he strode on the black highway, hulking and bright. But a wild grief in his wife's bosom cried, Look back, it is not too late for a last sight of the red towers of your native Sodom, the square where, you, where once you sang, the gardens you shall mourn, and the tall house with empty windows where you loved your husband and your babes were born. She turned, and looking on the bitter view, her eyes were welded shut by mortal pain. Into transparent salt her body grew, and her quick feet were rooted in the plain. Who would waste tears upon her? Is she not the least of our losses, this unhappy wife? Yet in my heart she will not be forgot, who, for a single glance, gave up her life. This is um, from Walking to Sleep in the Field. This field grass brushed our legs last night when out we stumbled looking up, wading as through the cloudy dregs of a wide sparkling cup, our thrown back heads aswim in the grand kept appointments of the air, save where a pine at the sky's rim took something from the bear. Black in her glinting chains, Andromeda feared nothing from the seas, preserved as by no hero's pains or hushed Euripides, and there the dolphin glowed, still flailing through a diamond froth of stars, flawless as when Orion rode one of its avatars. But none of that was true. What shapes that Greece or Babylon discerned had time not slowly drawn askew or like cat's cradles turned? And did we not recall that Egypt's north was in the dragon's tail? As if a form of type should fall and dash itself like hail, the heavens jumped away, bursting the cincture of the zodiac, shot flares with nothing left to say to us, not coming back unless they should at last, like hard-flung dice that ramble out the throw, be gathered for another cast. Whether that might be so, we could not say, but trued our talk a while to words of the real sky, chatting of class or magnitude, star clusters, nebulae, and how Antares, huge as Mars' big roundhouse swing, and more, was fled as in some rimless centrifuge into a blink of red. It was the nip of fear that told us when imagination caught the feel of what we said, came near the schoolbook thoughts we thought, and faked a scan of space blown black and hollow by our spent grenade, all worlds dashed out without a trace, the very light unmade. Then, in the late night chill, we turned and picked our way through outcrop stone by the faint starlight, up the hill to where our bed lamp shone. Today, in the same field, the sun takes all, and what could lie beyond? Those holes in heaven have been sealed like rain drills in a pond, and we, beheld in gold, see nothing starry but these galaxies of flowers, dense and manifold, which lift about our knees, white daisy drifts where you sink down to pick an armload as we pass, sighting the heel all's minor blue and chasms of the grass, and strews of hawkweed where, amongst the reds or yellows as they burn, a few dead poles commit to air the seeds of their return. We could no doubt mistake these flowers for some answer to that fright we felt for all creation's sake and our doc dark talk last night taking to heart what came of the heart's wish for life, which, staking here in the last field and endless claim, beats on from sphere to sphere and pounds beyond the sun, where nothing less peremptory can go, and is ourselves, and is the one unbounded thing we know. Um, and this last poem is called A Riddle for M.M.
Where far in forest I am laid, in a place ringed around by stones, look for no melancholy shade, and have no thoughts of buried bones, for I am bodiless and bright, and fill this glade with sudden glow. The leaves are washed in underlight, shade lies upon the boughs like snow. Thanks. I was pleased to be asked to read from the Mind Reader, <coughs> Mr. Wilbur's volume of 1976, which I have a particular fondness for, maybe because I reviewed it, I don't know, but there are a number, there are a number of wonderful poems in there that I had to ignore, and I just want to mention uh, the writer, which he often reads, Piccolo Commedia, which he also reads, which is marvelous, Cottage Street, 1953, which Tony Marks is going to read, and Children of Darkness, which is the last poem in the first part of the book about mushrooms. It almost made me like them. Now I'm going to read first C minor. Um, C minor is a reference to uh, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. I've got it, I've got it. Um, <clears throat> which begins, as you may know, ba 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 bum, ba 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 bum. And that heroic theme, during the Second World War at least, got associated, I think, with victory. And this is about music and about when you should listen to music and about the day. And you might pay attention to the rhymes, which are always good, but especially fine in this one. Beethoven during breakfast, the human soul, though stalked by hollow pluckings, winning out while bran flakes crackle in the cereal bowl over despair and doubt, you are right to switch it off. And let the day begin at hazard, perhaps with pecker knocks, in the sugar bush, the rancor of a jay, or in the letterbox, something that makes you pause and with fixed shadow stand on the driveway gravel, your bent head scanning the snatched pages until the sad or fortunate news is read. The day's work will be disappointing or not, giving at least some pleasure and taking pains. One of us hoeing in the garden plot unless, of course, it rains, may rejoice at the knitting of light in fennel plumes and do like mercury on cabbage hide, or rise and pace through two familiar rooms balked and dissatisfied. Shall a plate be broken, a new thing understood? Shall we be lonely and by love consoled? What shall I whistle splitting the kindling wood? Shall the night wind be cold? How should I know? And even if we were fated hugely to suffer, grandly to endure, it would not help to hear it all forestated as in an overture. There is nothing to do with a day except to live it. Let us have music again when the light dies, sullenly or in glory, and we can give it something to organize. Uh, the second poem <clears throat> is dedicated to a professor who was a professor at Amherst of English and Classics when both Dick and I were here, some years apart, uh, Professor Reuben Brower. And the Mind Reader was published in 1976, and Ben Brower died that year. And as I remember, at his memorial service in Belmont, uh, at his house, uh, Dick read this poem, this poem being the first one in the Mind Reader a storm in April. It seems appropriate for this winter, too. Some winters, taking leave, deal us a last hard blow, salting the ground like Carthage before they will go. But the bright milling snow which throngs the air today, it is a way of leaving so as to stay. The light flakes do not weigh the willows down, but sift through the white catkins, loose as petal drift, or in an updraft lift and glitter at a height dazzling as summer's leaf stir chinked with light. This storm, if I am right, will not be wholly over till green fields here and there turn white with clover, and through chill air the puffs of milkweed hover.
I first heard Richard Wilbur read his poetry when I was 18. That was 34 years ago. I remember every poem he read. And I think I remember how he read them. Um, I remember it must, I remember thinking as an 18 year old something special was happening, forgive this illusion, because I walked into a lecture hall like this at Wesleyan and, um, and in the back of the room sort of hiding was the president of the college who clearly decided he didn't care what other important things, supposedly important things, were on his schedule. He wanted to hear Richard Wilbur read. The idea that I am now reading Wilbur to Wilbur is um, amongst the most amazing <laughs> and bizarre moments of my time at Amherst. The poem I'm going to read is, um, is in part, it's about many things, but it's about uh, Dick's grappling, I think, with his own success and talent, and with what that implies about how one can be helpful and how one can find oneself helpless at the help that is needed. And I confess, I have thought and read this poem over those 32 years, particularly at times of tragedy, um, when moments of suicide have touched my life, this is the poem I go to. It's a poem, doesn't need much explanation, but I will give the one that I recall Richard Wilbur giving 32 years ago. Edna Ward, who figures here, was Dick's aunt on his mother's side, as I recall. Um, who is friends from Wellesley, um, Mrs. Ward is, with the mother of a young poet named Sylvia Plath. Sylvia is brought to Dick and introduced in the hope of, well, as you'll see, encouragement. Sylvia Plath took her life in 1963. Cottage Street, 1953. Framed in her phoenix fire screen, Edna Ward bends to the tray of Canton, pouring tea for frightened Mrs. Plath, then turning toward the pale, slumped daughter and my wife and me. Asks if, she, if we would prefer it weak or strong. Will we have milk or lemon? She inquires. The visit seems already strained and long. Each in his turn, we tell her our desires. It is my office to exemplify the published poet in his happiness. Thus cheering Sylvia, who has wished to die but half ashamed and impotent to bless. I am a stupid lifeguard who has found, swept to his shallows by the tide, a girl who far from shore has been immensely drowned and stares through water now with eyes of pearl. How large is her refusal, and how slight the genteel chat whereby we recommend life of a summer afternoon, despite the brewing dusk which hints that it may end. And Edna Ward shall die in 15 years, after her eight and eighty summers of such grace and courage as permit no tears. The thin hand reaching out, the last word, Love, outliving Sylvia, who condemned to live, shall study for a decade as she must to state at last her brilliant negative in poems free and helpless and unjust. I'll read first the original by Vinicius de Moraes, Canção. Não leves nunca de mim, Ophelia, que tu me deste, a doces 
úmida, tranquila, filhinha que tu me deste. Deixa que bem me persiga o seu balbúcio celeste. Não o leves. Deixa comigo que bem me persiga a fim de que eu não queira comigo a primogênita em mim. A fria, seca, encruada filha que a morte me deu, que vive de sedentada, do leite que não é seu. E que de noite me chama, com a voz mais triste que há, é para dizer que me ama, é para chamar-me de pai. Não deixes nunca partir, a filha que tu me deste, a fim de que eu não prefira a outra que é mais agreste, mas que não parte de mim. Another translation. Song. Never take her away, the daughter whom you gave me, the gentle, moist, untroubled, small daughter whom you gave me. Oh, let her heavenly babbling beset me and enslave me. Don't take her, let her stay, beset my heart and win me that I may put away the firstborn child within me, that cold, petrific, dry daughter whom death once gave, whose life is a long cry for milk she may not have, and who in the nighttime calls me in the saddest voice that can be, father, father, and tells me of the love she feels for me. Don't let her go away, her whom you gave, my daughter, lest I should come to favor that wilder one, that other, who does not leave me ever. So I'm going to read a couple of poems for or about children, um, because Richard Weber can do that exceptionally well. This first one is called A Barred Owl from Mayflies. The warping night air, having brought the boom of an owl's voice into her, her darkened room, we tell the wakened child that all she heard was an odd question from a forest bird, asking of us, if rightly listened to, who cooks for you, and then, who cooks for you? Words which can make our terrors bravely clear can also thus domesticate a fear and send a small child back to sleep at night, not listening for the sound of stealthy flight or dreaming of some small thing in a claw born up to some dark branch and eaten raw. So the rest of what I'm going to read, I guess they're called children's poems, but I read them when I was about 18, and I thought they were the epitome of art, so I don't know if they're really children's poems. Um, these first few come from the disappearing alphabet, and, well, I think they'll explain themselves. If the alphabet began to disappear, some words would soon look raggedy and queer, like quirl, chimpanzee, and choo-choo tray, while others would entirely fade away. And since it is by words that we construe the world, the world would start to vanish too. Good heavens, it would be an awful mess if everything dissolved to nothingness. Be careful then, my friends, and do not let anything happen to the alphabet. If D did not exist, some creatures might wish, like the dodo bird, to fade from sight. For instance, any self-respecting duck would rather be extinct than be an uck. Hail letter F, if it were not for you, our raincoats would merely be waterproof, and that is such a stupid word, I doubt that it would help to keep the water out. <laughs> no N, in such a state of things, birds would have wigs instead of wings, and though a wig might suit the owl, who is a staid and judge-like fowl, most birds would rather fly than wear a mat of artificial hair. What would our proud bald eagle say if he were offered a toupee? How strange that the banana's slippery peel without its pea would be a slippery eel. It makes you think. However, it is not profound enough to think about a lot. <laughs> All right, here's the last one. The letter X will never disappear. The more you cross it out, the more it's here. But if it vanished, treasure maps would not have anything with which to mark the spot. And treasure aisles would ring with the despair of puzzled pirates digging everywhere. All right, and now a couple from The Pig and the Spigot. Um, in these, um, there's one word hidden inside of another. Um, help, hopefully, this has italics, and I can't really talk in italics, but hopefully it will be obvious which word is inside of which. Um, all right, here we go. 
When there's a pig inside your spigot, you must not cry out. There's nothing I can do. Be sensible and take the obvious course, which is to turn the spigot on full force. Sufficient water pressure will, I think, oblige the pig to flow into the sink. I don't see why a belfry should contain an elf. The notion strikes me as insane. A bell tower or a church's lofty steeple is not the place for so-called little people. Belfry should be inhabited by bats, not small fictitious men in pointed hats. <laughs> when battling airplanes chase each other around till one is hit and crashes to the ground, it's called a dogfight. Is that, do you suppose, why there's an arf in warfare? Heaven knows. All right, one more. Now that you've read this book, I, I'll ho sorry. Now that you've read this book, I hope you'll say that what you found inside it was okay. The other word inside of book is boo, but don't say that. I'll hate it if you do. <laughs> Thanks. I will be reading the 25th canto of Dante's Inferno, first the original followed by the translation. Al fine delle sue parole, il ladro, le mani al so con amendue le fiche, gridando, togli Dio, cate le squadro. Da indi in qua mi for la serpi amiche, per cuna li savolse allora al collo, come dicese, non vo che più, che, non vo che più dica. E un'altra le braccia e di le gollo, ribadendo se stessa, si dinanzi, che non potea con esse dare un crollo. Ai, pistoia, pistoia, che non stanzi di incenerarti, sì che più non duri, poiché in malfare il seme tu avanzi. Per tutti i cerchi dell'inferno scuri non vidi spirito in Dio tanto superbo, non quel che cade, che cade a tebe giù da muri. Now the translation. The thief, when he had done with prophecy, made figs of both his lifted hands and cried, Take these, O God, for they are aimed at thee. Then was my heart upon the serpent's side, for round his neck one curled like a garot, as if to say, enough of ranting pride. And another pinned his arms and tied a knot of head and tail in front of him again, so tightly that they could not stir one jot. Alas, Pistoia, why dost thou not ordain that thou be burnt to ashes, since thou hast that out sinned the base begetters of thy strain? In the, in the dark rounds of hell through which I passed, I saw no spirit so blaspheme his lord, not him who from the Theban wall was cast. I'll be reading three poems. The first is from New Poems, published in 2004, I believe. It is called Asides. Though the seasons begun to speak its long sentence of darkness, the upswept boughs of the larch bristle with gold for a week. And then there is only the willow to make bright interjection, its drooping branches decked with thin leaves curved and yellow, till winter, loosening these with a first flurry and bluster, shall scatter across the snow crest their dropped parentheses. The second two poems are both from Anterooms, published this past year, I think. The first is called The House. Sometimes, on waking, she would close her eyes for a last look at that white house she knew in sleep alone and held no title to and had not entered yet, for all her size. What did she tell me of that house of hers? White gatepost, terrace, fanlight of the door, a widow's walk above the bouldered shore, salt winds that ruffle the surrounding firs. Is she now there, wherever there may be? Only a foolish man would hope to find that haven fashioned by her dreaming mind. Night after night, my love, I put to sea. And the last is called a measuring worm. This yellow striped green caterpillar climbing up the steep window screen constantly for lack of a full set of legs keeps humping up his back. It's as if he sent by a sort of semaphore dark omegas meant to warn of last things Although he doesn't know it, he will soon have wings. And I too don't know toward what undreamt condition, inch by inch, I go. Happy birthday, Professor.
Um, Robert Frost said that uh, poetry is what gets lost in translation. But uh, there is no poetry without translation. And uh, all poets are translators, even those that live in only one language. When Borges read uh, Dick Wilbur's translation of his poem, Everness, he was at awe and wondered if a translation can supersede the original. First, the original, Everness, by Jorge Luis Borges, the Argentine writer, and then the translation. Solo una cosa no hay es el olvido, Dios que salva el metal, salva la escoria, y cifra en su profética memoria las lunas que serán y las que han sido. Ya todo está, los miles de reflejos que entre los dos crepúsculos del día tu rostro fue dejando en los espejos y los que irá dejando todavía. Y todo es una parte del diverso cristal de esa memoria, el universo. No tienen fin sus arduos corredores y las puertas se cierran a tu paso. Solo del otro lado del ocaso verás los arquetipos y esplendores. One thing does not exist, oblivion. God saves the metal and he saves the dross, and his prophetic memory guards from loss the moons to come and those of evenings gone. Everything is the shadows in the glass, which in between the day's two twilights you have scattered by the thousands or shall strew henceforth in the mirrors that you pass. And everything is part of that diverse crystalline memory, the universe. Whoever through its endless mazes wanders, hears door on door click shot behind his stride, and only from the sunset's farther side shall view at last the archetypes and splendors. And now, uh, Dick Wilbur's wonderful poem, The Proof, with a freshly made translation into Spanish as a tribute in his 90th birthday. Shall I love God for causing me to be? I was mere utterance, shall these words love me? Yet when I cast his work to jar and stammer, and one free subject loosened all his grammar, I love him that he did not in a rage, once and forever rule me of the page. But thinking I might come to please him yet, crossed out delete and, and wrote his patient's tet. La prueba. Debo amar a Dios por permitir que fuera, yo que mero verbo soy, si amor su expresión me diera, porque el yo hacer que su obra tropezara y un tema libre su gramática quebrara, lo amo porque hizo él desde su conmoción que en la página yo tuviera mi ocasión, y creyendo que quizá de mí un placer saldría, tachó borrar y un paciente dejar escribiría. And now, um, as a... As a as a way to, to celebrate the celebration, maybe, it, Dick will read a poem. a few minutes of the Academy Awards recently <laughs> and, uh, and I, uh, I noticed how hard it is for honorees simply to say thank you and let it go <laughs> at that. Uh, I'm going to say that in a, in, in a moment uh, uh, after which I'll go back to my uh, hick town in western Massachusetts. Uh, uh, and, and here is a, uh, a little poem uh, spoken by me as a Cummington, Massachusetts hick. Out here, strangers might wonder why that big snow shovels leaning against the house in July. Has it some cryptic meaning? It means at least to say that here we needn't be neat about putting things away as on some suburban street. 
What's more, by leaning there, the shovel seems to express with its rough and ready air a boast of ruggedness. If a stranger said in sport, I see you're prepared for snow, our shovel might retort, out here you never know. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, thank you.